the time that we are in right now, I feel is great for the buyer who doesn't want competition for the home he's gonna purchase or she's gonna purchase. They have the need and they have the means and then once you get the home, you actually, now you own it. Here's something else to think about. When you purchase a home, there's three things that you're going to experience when you purchase it. Number one is, is you're going to experience uh, equity, just the appreciation of owning the home. Number two is you're gonna get the principal reduction. And then number three is you've achieved the goal of buying the home for whatever reason you needed to. Quality of life goes up when you have a need and you meet the need. If you're, you're, say your wife is pregnant and you're looking to, you need a home that has, you know, a nursery, uh, you know, guest room and nursery, you're living in a one bedroom or two bedroom in the city, you need to, you know, upsize to say a three bedroom home in the suburbs or somewhere close to where you're living. Purchasing the home along with the other two, the equity appreciation and the principal reduction, now you've achieved the need that you got of, of, of the need of buying the home, your motivation. And because you you've experienced that your quality of life raises. Those are just some things to think about when someone asks me, you know, hey, Dan, this is a great time to buy. Um, you know, I know that rates are so, you know, rates are high. And look, guys, let me say this too. <laughs> None of us remember when interest rates were 15, 16% in the early 80s. I was, shoot, five, six when they were. So it's because I don't remember it doesn't mean it didn't happen. Interest rates were 15 to 16% at that time. And people were still buying homes. Why? Because they had a need. Uh, talking about this time and uh, where we are is in the market. You know, we have these, these factors going on that are, you know, causing interest rates to go high. And, and one of them, I'm sure everybody hears the term inflation. Yes, inflation's, you know, 8%, it's 10%. And um, you know, we hear it every day and it's a, you know, really to get into and dive into inflation, it's probably uh, a discussion for another day, but, you know, since I brought it up, I will say that there are, from what I've, you know, the research that we've done in, in the industry, there are generally three factors that influence inflation. Number one is production costs. Number two is demand. And number three is our country's fiscal policy. And to just kind of touch on each one, like production costs, I'm sure you hear all the time these, you know, during COVID, we have supply chain problems. There's supply chain problems. So you're you're not able to get the items and the things that you need. So then what happens is people will pay more for them. Um, the demand, you have increased demand because the things, the, the items that you want, you're not able to get. And then our fiscal policy, uh, which is basically our government um and their monetary policy. Now, we obviously just had a pandemic and in, I believe it was 2020, the government printed two, uh, three, not two, $3 trillion with a T, not billion with a B, a trillion with a T. That's a lot of money to now be, to, to now get, you know, just thrown into the system. So they did that to counter, you know, COVID's economic impact. People didn't have to pay their their rent, um, and then some of these lenders gave you know mortgage forbearance things of that nature. But from a tenant, I, I can give it from a tenant and a landlord perspective from what I've seen uh, in my travels during this, and I've seen it from both sides. It, it was a very very hard line to toe because there were tenants who couldn't pay their mortgage or to pay their rent because they weren't working because everything was shut down. And then the problem was you had owners who had mortgages that couldn't pay them because the tenants weren't paying the rent. And I was, it, it was hard because you see it from both sides. You see the tenant's perspective of, hey, I can't pay because I'm not working because I can't work because they forced me not to work. And then you have the owner who says, well, wait a minute, I gotta pay my mortgage and you're not paying rent. So you had that kind of, that, that, that back and forth and it was a very, very hard, I still know owners to this day um, that have buildings where the tenants are just not paying. And, and I don't know if I could say COVID's over, but all of the guidelines have been eased. Unfortunately, these tenants still have not paid and these owners don't know, you know, they're, they're, they don't know what to do. We got to where we are now and here's where we are. Now we are at an almost 8% interest rate. 
Let me say that again. We are at an almost 8% interest rate. In January, we were at three, almost three, you know, three or a little more. So from three, we went from a 3% interest rate to an 8% interest rate in one calendar year. Let me, one more time. We went from a 3% interest rate to an 8% interest rate in one calendar year, almost eight. By the end of the year, it's now November, what, 10th or 11th, whatever it is. By the end of the year, do not be surprised if we are at eight for someone taking out a loan. That's where we are. That's never happened in the history of this, uh, the real estate market. It's never happened. So that is how hard the government is trying to pull that lever and rein in the economy and rein in real estate. That's how hard they're doing it. So again, so then it goes back to that question of should I buy? Is this a good time to buy? And I will always base that answer on what is your need? What's your need? Is your need to, uh, are you expanding your family? Are you relocating? Uh, unfortunately, maybe you're getting a divorced um, and you need to buy something else or sell or sell the home because you're, you know, you're getting divorced. Or if you're looking to sell, maybe unfortunately somebody has passed and the home needs to go through uh, probate. We can help you out with that too. As the consumer and as the client, what is your need? It is my duty and my job to serve you and, and achieve the goals of what you're looking to accomplish the, to the best of my ability. Look at it like a, like a, okay, it's like a, like a track. High rates, which means low demand, which means a good time from, for if I'm looking to buy and I don't want competition, good time. And then in a couple of years, when rates come back down, because we know with 100% certainty, they will at some point, then you just refinance. And that's, and, but again, now you have the asset and you have the equity appreciation and you have the principal, the principal buy down, the mortgage buy down. Now you own a piece of real estate in the United States of America. You own it. You're not renting anymore. Um, and it's not that renting is bad. Let's, let's, let's take a sidebar here. Renting serves a purpose. And it serves a purpose for someone who, number one, might be unsure with where they're going to be geographically. Maybe they think that, you know, in a year or two, they're going to be living in another state. So it wouldn't make sense to purchase something. So renting does serve. Maybe you just, you, you, your job is very transient. You're traveling all the time and you're not home to have, you know, to upkeep the home. Renting is perfect for you. It's perfect. So renting is not, I know there's a, there's a perceived notion that, you know, renting is throwing, you're, you're paying your owner's mortgage. Well, yeah, you are, but you're also able to achieve the goals you have for your own life because owning a home isn't, is not optimal for you. Selling is not telling. Selling is just asking questions. Your reason for doing something is different than mine, is different than his, different than hers, different than theirs. Everybody's is different. We just have to figure out, you know, what it is. Is it number one, what are you looking to do? Number two, is it achievable? And number three, can I help you make it happen? That's generally what a seller is looking for. You know, can you help me? How quickly can you do it? And how much is it going to cost me? <laughs> That's really your your three questions. So, I think that, you know, me personally, if it was something I was looking to do because I had a need to buy, I'm absolutely going to do it. Uh, I think that uh, if your motivation is there and you can, again, I'll go right back to what I said before. If the payment is feasible for you and it is not stretching you financially, I think it is a good time to take a look and purchase a home because the competition for it, it's eminently less than it was 12 months ago, 18 months ago, 24 months ago, when everybody was just in a frenzy to get out of this, the urban areas and things of that nature and going um, to you know suburban areas and, and rural areas. So that demand is gone. It's just gone. So now the conversations that us as brokers are having with uh, our clients are, it's not, all right, hey, let's talk about the seven offers that we have and we'll figure out which one's best for you. Now the conversation is, okay, um, we've been on the market now for you know two weeks, three weeks, or whatever however much time it is, and you know we're just not seeing the amount of traction and offers that we had hoped, showings that we had hoped. Uh, so uh, you know, 
Are we open to having a discussion about you know adjusting the price? Because let's think about this. There are two ways to create value in the uh, eyes of the public and as of a buyer, but also in the eyes of people that are purchasing something. And what we know to be true now is the days of you know putting a property on the market and getting you know seven, eight, nine, ten offers in like a week or two. Uh, that market has uh, you know has changed. So that's the good thing for a buyer right now is you're able to actually be able to get a home that you're looking to uh, to purchase, and even for a seller, you know, they're the, they're the, look, even if you know you weren't able to get you know the exact number you were you wanted to get twelve months ago. Your need is still there to sell. We will get you the absolute most amount that a buyer is willing to pay. And again, as a, a broker and an agent, that is my job to do for you. And we would do that uh, to the best of our ability. So now, having said that, we are going to pivot to the last part of our show. <laughs> the last part of the show, pivot. That always reminds me of, did you ever see that, um, that Friends episode when Ross just screams? He's like, pivot. And he screams that out. Pivot! Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! <laughs> That's what we're going to do. We're going to pivot to the last part of the show, which is some Danism quotes. Um, so some of you who know me, my friends always say that there are words that I use that are just Danisms. They don't even know what they mean. But uh, I'm going to use some Danism quotes today. Some of these uh, I've made up. Some of them I've heard over my travels and um, use them in my daily life. Uh, I live them uh, all the time, no, but I make a concerted effort to really just uh, to live the best I can. And these are some of the, the, the quotes that I live by. Um, they're all a part of what makes the man that is Dan sitting in front of you. So the first one is, uh, and this is an important one because your news media knows this, the human mind absorbs negativity seven times more than positivity. Your news medias know that. Social media knows that. It's why you hear, if you just turn on the news and turn your back to it and you listen to it, you're gonna hear a story about somebody getting shot. You're gonna hear a story about, uh, they'll tease, there's a food in your cabinet that might kill you, news at 11. And they'll tease you for that. Why? Because it gets something in, it's in your, your brain. It's like your frontal lobe. That negativity hits that part of your brain. And the news medias know that. The human mind and the brain reacts to that. So it's like you have to be cognizant of what you are putting in your mind every day. It can change your mood. Just hearing something and getting angry, looking at your phone and looking at something on social media that's negative, it completely affects your mood. You know, uh, many of you know that that are friends of mine. I, I I've gone to numerous Tony Robbins seminars, um, and he he says this a lot: what you focus on, you feel. So if you are focused, just be cognizant of what you're focusing on. Are you focusing on the fact that somebody cut you off, and now you're going to be angry for the rest of your day? Are you focusing on the te the news teaser that something could be in your cabinet that's going to really harm you? Number two, Danism. Uh, this is uh, something that I heard in my travels from a very, very wise man uh, once. A belief is just an idea that we develop loyalty to over time. How we come to believe something. Like, let's think about that. We'll go through like your life influences. <clears throat> so you're at a baby. You know, I can, you can hold the baby in like the palm of your hands. This baby's like this mold of this ball of clay that's going to get molded. So from, you know, zero to probably, I don't know, uh, zero to eight, maybe nine, the child's primary influence is their parents. So everything that their parents, you know, believe, fears, love, uh, joy, all of that all goes into this child, this beautiful child. And then um, usually eight, nine, 10, you know, they, they start to, uh, you know, they're going out of the house more. They're a little more mobile as far as doing their own thing. So who do their influences become? Parents, but also teachers and their, their friends' parents, because now you're spending time at your friend's house and you're hearing their opinions and their beliefs on certain things. And your child brain start, is hearing all this and it's absorbing it. 
and and forming opinions unconsciously in their head. And then as the child goes to, you know, young teen, like adolescent, and primarily their um their influences are going to be their friends, parents, teachers, and coaches. Parents are still there, but they're spending less and less time at home and more and more time out. So now those influences become more. And then as you get to a young adult and an adult, you know, uh, you, you get you get a car, you know, maybe you're starting college, your primary influences are professors and coaches if you're in sports, things of that nature. Your parents are, st again, they're still there, but it's much, much, much less because they're spending less and less time with your mother and father. So generally around that time, your brain has formed these opinions and been told like these beliefs, you've been given all these beliefs from these influences. The At some point in your life, you'll start to question, do I really believe that? And if they have an open mind, will start to question that and start to come up with maybe their own. So you have to basically unlearn a belief to relearn a different belief. It's like you have to unlearn and then relearn. And the number three Danism, like rules of life, um, you know, things that I do my best to practice is incremental change over time um, creates something magical. Let me say that again. Incremental change over time creates something magical. And it can be in any facet of your life, physical, spiritual, mental, emotional, um, financial, in, in any facet, that incremental change over time, just it creates something so magical because uh, I, I was, you know, when I go to the gym, I saw this once, it said, in four weeks, you'll see results of your body changing. In eight weeks, your family sees results. And then in 12 weeks, like the public will see results. So in one month, I'll see it. Two months, my family will see it. Three months, the public will see it. So that's something like physical. Persistence gets it. Consistency keeps it. If you are persistent at whatever goal you want, every day you do something. Not You don't have to be perfect, but if you do something, to get towards that goal, just one thing every day, you're growing towards it. Like think about a tree, like like a, a tree or a leaf of grass. If a tree or a leaf of grass is not growing, it's dying. I would share it like this: set the goal, write it down, and then keep it with you. Keep that goal with you, and look at it over time. And again, are you doing something every day? to get closer to that goal. Someone who wants to start here and come down. I always word it like this to them. Mr. Mathieu, look at it like this. One strategy, the price gets bid down. The other strategy, the price gets bid up.